like when somebody finds the right pet, a look of delight on their face, well, that's priceless, isn't it? But if everybody's going to win on a deal like this, it needs to be a good fit. You know, even with good training and management, there can be problems. And you don't want to make a responsibility like that a surprise for somebody. Anybody here ever had a problem like that? Did they, anybody here receive a pet that, you know, timing wasn't right? Maybe the choice wasn't right. You should have made the choice yourself. Put it in the comment line. Tell me about it. I have this little girl here, and she's wearing a Christmas bow just because we're, we're talking about Christmas pets here. And in case we haven't met, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel, along with the Nickel family border collie, Miss America here, who's breathing heavily into my microphone. And this is Tony, and Gaston is over there waiting for a snack because Carolyn is preparing the little indoor hunting feeders that keep these cats focused on the table here while we're doing this kind of stuff. Um, so, I'd like to read you a story. I'll tell you a story. I have it printed out, of course, just so that I don't forget any of the details. Um, but this is, a, this is a pet I saw about a year and a half ago, and it is, uh, or was, oh, Tony T. My goodness gracious, what a naughty cat. Well, you can expect that, right? Okay. <laughs> Jeez. All right, I'm going to put that one over there. All right. What can I tell you? Out of control, right? So, oh, thank you, Carolyn. This way I can see the notes that people are sending me. That's always important. Okay. So, this is a case of a dog named Nala. She was four and a half years old when I saw her. Female spayed, uh, a lab pit bull cross. And she was found stray. You know, it could have gone either way with this dog. And how often do people actually really make a choice? They kind of fall in love with pets. And in this case, this dog was found on the street. And she'd been in the home since she was found at about age one year. So they'd already had her three and a half years. She's a sweet dog, was bonded to her person, Jasmine. Um, and I'm sorry. Bonded to, <laughs> bonded to her person, Taylor. Um, Taylor had a daughter named Jasmine, but that little girl wasn't in the picture when Nala was adopted because what happened was that Nala actually was found on the street, but then her husband, Taylor's husband, knew somebody who found the dog and gave the dog as a gift to Taylor. Okay, And it was just the two of them. And then uh, Taylor's husband died. Young man. I never got the details on what happened. It's young adults. That's so tragic. Well, anyway. So here's, here's uh, uh, Taylor now with Nala. And uh, she finds out that she's expecting. And her husband's already passed away. So, of course, you know, here comes the baby. Here comes uh, Jasmine. And um, everything's fine. You know, the dogs seem to accept little... Uh, uh, little Jasmine, just no problem at all, until Jasmine got mobile. And then the politics change. And people make, frankly, a lot of completely inappropriate assumptions because they, they put human emotions on members of another species. That's understandable. You know, we see life through the human lens, but cats and dogs are members of a different species, and they function differently. Did you notice these little ribbons I, we, we decoratively have? This is, this is Carolyn's work. She's making sure that these cats look festive and, and seasonally appropriate. Okay, so, um, of course, what ended up happening was that Nala growled at, at Jasmine, the little girl, and, uh, of course, the reaction from Taylor was to yell and to punish the dog, and she realized pretty quickly that nothing was changing, and she might as well stop that nonsense, and, and frankly, it is, because it never helps. Um, I understand that people do it, you get frustrated, and with a child like that, uh, you can be afraid for the well-being of that child, as well you should be, but that kind of emotion-based reaction is not going to help us, and we need to understand these problems, okay? So, um, she called my office for a consultation, which Carolyn spoke to her and immediately told her, rule number one, immediately separate that dog from that child, keep them in separate places, use a baby gate, uh, don't let them be together until they had a chance to consult with me, which they did, and we didn't have any disasters prior to the consultation. 
Sometimes it takes a couple weeks to get people in because the schedule tends to fill up. Well, so here's what happened. On two occasions, Nala, the, the pit bull lab cross, four and a half years old, nipped at little Jasmine's hands. And they were air snaps. Now, is that like innocent? Is that something that we should be concerned there's a risk with that kind of stuff? Um, well, yeah, we ought to be concerned. Um, but there was no contact. So, you know, let's work with where we, with where we stood at the moment. So Taylor was taking Jasmine, in, in the case of one of these snaps, uh, Taylor was lifting her little girl Jasmine, 18 months old, out of the high chair. And, you know, kids, you know, they're throwing stuff all the time. When, when our kids were small, I thought my back was going to be permanently damaged because I spent so much of my time bending down, picking stuff up, food and everything else. And, of course, kids that age love to throw food on the floor because the dog's right there. And they get this cause and effect thing. They get to watch the dog snack on the food. Well, here's what happened. Taylor lifted her little girl Jasmine out of the high chair, and little Jasmine was holding a piece of food. It, you know, popped out of her hand, ended up on the floor, and she put the little girl on the floor, and that little girl went after that piece of food at the same time that Nala the dog did. Now we've got competition, right? Well, dogs, of course, are sure that the Great Famine is going to come any minute, and if they don't get all of the food right now, they won't get any of it because that sense of scarcity is pretty fundamental to what dogs are. So here we have um, that dog going, snapping at that little girl. Didn't contact her, but that was food related. Uh, but also the little girl was reaching toward the dog as well as toward the food. So which is it? Well, the truth is it was both. And we know that because this kind of problem occurred another time when that little toddler, she was actually, you know, just mobile and she wanted to grab that dog. And she had a history of grabbing her skin and pinching her hard the way kids do because they see everything with their hands. And actually, Nala was quite good with that little girl. Thank you for the hearts. Um, and she was good with other children that she'd interacted with. It was when that little girl, Jasmine, uh, trundled after that dog, and that dog was in the corner of the room with some furniture, and the dog suddenly didn't feel like she had any escape. And you think, well, that doesn't make any sense. The dog is infinitely more agile, stronger, and it, you know, compared to an 18-month-old child, probably smarter. Well. It doesn't matter when a dog panics. Uh, they can believe that you know, their life is at risk and they can become defensive aggressive toward a little child. And you think, that makes no sense. It makes no human sense. But we're talking about a member of another species. Okay, We have to be a little empathic for the dog. Let's try to walk a mile in the dog's shoes who doesn't understand what's going on. Actually, not genetically programmed behaviorally to live in the confines of a, of a building, a house with walls and, and rooms and furniture. Most dogs adapt, but some of them can freak out when they feel trapped, even by a little kid. And those are the realities. So, um, uh, what happened? Well, you know, here's Taylor. She thinks, my goodness, maybe I better get rid of this dog. It's a danger to my child. Well, I can understand that that concept, you know, we love our kids, right? And you cannot let them be at risk. But maybe we could unravel this thing and make this thing a healthier situation, which, by the way, we did. So um, here's what I recommended to Taylor. I said, I explained that Nala becomes anxious when that little girl comes after her. And we can sidestep that. We can manage things differently. Um, so uh, what she needed to do uh, was understand that that air snapping and growling that Nala had done towards little Jasmine, those were communications. Oh, I'm not going to say it wasn't aggressive communications. It certainly was. But when dogs start to see something coming for them and they're getting nervous about it, they communicate with canine body signaling, which another dog would intrinsically understand. But dogs don't recognize that humans don't uh, understand canine language because people don't do they unless you're trained in it and so what does that little girl know 18 months old she doesn't understand canine body signaling and so she paid no attention she just kept coming and here's Nala whose panic is ramping up and so she goes verbal by growling and dogs seldom communicate verbally 
Um, they do almost all of it by subtle body language cues, which again, that little child missed it all, right? So she growls and then she snaps. Now, people think they're pretty quick when they can intervene fast and pull the dog away or separate dogs or people from dogs who are biting and all that stuff. Uh, don't kid yourself. Sure, separate them, but also understand that dogs are infinitely more uh, quicker with their reactions than people are ever going to be. And this dog would have injured that child had she wanted to, but she didn't want to. She had what we call bite inhibition. Now, you remember that Taylor, she's a grown-up adult woman, but she didn't choose to have this dog, although she grew to love her. It was a surprise gift from her husband who had passed away, and, you know, that meant something to her. But now she's got this little girl. I mean, this is an emotional quandary, big time. So, what, what are we going to do about this? Well, um, I explained that she's got to recognize the threat that, um, uh, that Nala felt in these things and not let these children, this dog and this child be together unsupervised, okay? Number one. And so, this little child was not going to approach that dog at all if she was with her mother and the dog, that little girl would be managed. And parents are busy people. So when she couldn't be doing hands-on supervision, then Nala would be on the other side of the baby gate. And it wasn't going to be a problem. This is not a dog who would approach that child and just bite. There are dogs who can be offensive, aggressive. We don't see those very often. Um, and so on the other side of the baby gate, this dog had no reason to be worried. Okay? So, now, we want that little girl to interact with this dog, and we want this little girl to un understand how to do it right. Well, let's face it. You know, many people think that their dogs are, are well-behaved or do what they're told because they want to please their person. Actually, that's not true. <laughs> dogs love us, there's no doubt, and they're man's and women's best friend. No question. They belong with us. They are domestic companions. But the disconnect that many people have with this kind of stuff is that they believe that the dog is, you know, just wants to make them happy. When in fact, your dog loves to see you happy, but what she's really doing is earning resources from her leader because that's how they're programmed to function in a free living social group. They look to their leader for behavioral cues and for opportunities to earn resources, including food, but attention and pets and all the affection. All of that stuff is a privilege for dogs. They don't believe they have a natural entitlement for it. Well, obviously children do, but this is not a child. This is actually an adult of a different species, and so is this right here. And, and they're very different than each other. So again, the empathy thing, let's recognize that they're different and work with that. So the difference here is that that little girl can learn to be a leader at 18 months. And she can have a treat bag on her hip, just like her mother, get one for each, and put just one or two treats in little Jasmine's treat bag. And then I have people put a piece of tape, like masking tape or duct tape, on the floor. And that little girl stands there and puts her toes on the tape. And she has a treat in her hand. And there's Jasmine, or I'm sorry, Nala, the dog, across the room. And she can learn to tell that dog to come. She holds that treat out and she says, Nala, come. And that dog comes to her and gets immediately reinforced with the food. Well, this child has taught that dog that she's a leader. If she can put two, two words together in a sentence, Nala, come, then that dog can say, ooh, you are a purveyor of resources. You could be, right now, my ticket to survival, because that's how dogs think, even though they're pets. So that dog looks to that child and goes, if I do what I'm told, I'm going to earn that food, and that little girl is a leader. She is a superior of mine. Now, kids that age, you know, you can give them instructions and it's in one ear and out the other pretty quickly, but they get the concept of cause and effect, and they like to be the boss of somebody, don't they? And so this little girl could be the boss of this dog, but only under her mother's supervision at all other times when mom... And so this is one of these things that we parents have to really pay attention to, is that if we're going to have pets and children in the house, we absolutely never allow them to be together without close supervision, even with pets who have a stellar history with children. You say, oh, never going to be a problem. 
you never assume. All right. So that was the takeaway on this thing. But yeah, it was a challenge that Taylor never bargained for. But she had the, uh, you know, she had the maturity to seek out a, a specialist. Um, and I, you know, figured out what was going on exactly in that situation, and we stayed in touch. And uh, she has emailed me and said, "Use that story. We've done great." So. I not only know that she's a responsible pet parent, she's a mighty good child parent too. You know, she's paying attention. And for a single parent, I can only imagine how challenging that must be. So, you know, what if you're going to adopt a pet um, and you're going to give it as a gift? It's Christmas time, right? Please do not make it a surprise. If you want to do this, and I'm going to show you some great ways, uh, I'm going to give you some resources on how to select a pet, but if you plan to do this thing, go together. And if you want this other person, whether it's a child or your spouse or your significant other, um, and you would like them to have a pet because you know they're, they're fond of cats or dogs, and you want them to enjoy that kind of unconditional love, which I'll tell you what, I don't know what I would do without the pets I've had in my life, right? So we want to share that. So if you want to share that, then what you need to do is you get the pet, let the other person choose it if you like. But you are the primary responsible person. Even if the person who's getting the gift, pet, is an adult just like you, you take the responsibility right from the word go. You're the one who makes sure that the training and the management happens the way it should be. And then you can share that with the other person. Then you're in it together. And that's pretty healthy, right? So. You know, there's so many holes in the system, and there are things that can go wrong. Here's a, just an abstract from a study. I'm not going to read you the whole thing. Just a couple of valuable sentences. It's called Preliminary Assessment of Differences in Completeness of House Training Between Dogs Based on Size. Well, there's a big one, isn't it? A lot of people want to get adult dogs because they figure they're already house trained, right? Now, most cats are going to litter train pretty much themselves if you manage the litter correctly. Um, but, cat, but dogs, you know, you have to train them as puppies, and people think, well, if I get an adult dog, it's already house trained. Not necessarily. Now, there's no hard and fast rules. There's nothing that's absolute. But, you know, in medicine, I don't care whether it's behavior, internal medicine, surgery, whatever it is. Thank you, Carolyn. Gentlemen, anybody here want a little indoor hunting feeder where we have a taker? Oh, a couple of, a couple of customers here. Um, so we look, at, uh, we look at probabilities, and the probability is this. 735 dog parents were surveyed, and we, the results were that large breed dogs were significantly more likely to be fully house trained than small breed dogs. Now, we don't really know why that's the case, and there are lots of small breed dogs who are reliably house trained, and there are some big dogs, of course, who aren't. But generally speaking, that reflects my experience because people bring that problem to me as well. And of course, you know, that's not just always just house training challenges. Sometimes it's bladder disease. Sometimes it's a dog uh, or cat who is producing way too much urine volume because they have a problem like diabetes or kidney failure, uh, other issues too. Um, but we, we definitely want to set people up for success. So. You may be adopting an adult pet that was relinquished to the shelter because the people didn't know how to handle its behavior. And its behavior challenges might have been so minor that they just didn't know what to do. Good, not necessarily a big challenge, or it might be. Um, but the house training thing, if that's super important and you want as least likely challenge as possible, then a small breed dog with their little walnut-sized bladders may may not be the right dog for you. Okay, just, just to give you a heads up on that. I recently saw a, a, another veterinarian. Sometimes they bring me their pets because you know, their pets have behavior disorders too sometimes. This doctor was a researcher, had been throughout his career, been at this game only a few years less than I have. And uh, he was explaining that, um, and we did fine with his dog by the way, but uh, he said, you know, when he was a veterinary student, um, there was so much Cindy, it's you. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, after studying all of the medical issues that can go wrong uh, with pets, 
When he graduated, he said he always loved pets, one of the biggest reasons he wanted to become a veterinarian, and on his graduation day, he looked ahead and thought, do I even want to get a dog? There's so much that can go wrong. Well, of course he did. I ended up helping him with a behavior disorder of one of his dogs. But you know, these things are challenges, and everybody needs to be ready in case you adopt a pet that is a big challenge instead of a couple of small ones. So here's another study. I'll be real brief about this too. I know this stuff can be a little bit, you know, dry. But this is called the effects of pre-adoption counseling on the prevention of separation anxiety in newly adopted shelter dogs. Let me read you a couple of things here. Separation anxiety is one of the most prevalent and difficult to treat behavior problems in dogs. It causes damage to the human-animal bond, leading to relinquish, relinquishment or return to an animal shelter. That happens all the time. Many of these dogs are, frankly, terribly destructive when left home alone. Uh, and they can house soil, they can chew stuff up, they can damage the door, they can bark nonstop, literally, while their person is gone. The neighbors can turn you into animal control and, oh, it can be tough. We have a great way of working with it. Let me talk about that in just a minute. It's this excellent non-medication device. Uh, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, but anyway, um, this was a prospective, randomized, parallel group study. Uh, there were 133 participants, all of whom were new pet owners, who had gotten their dogs from shelters six, approximately six months previously. So they were relatively new dog owners. And of those 133 people who participated in this survey, 19 of them reported their dogs having separation anxiety. Now let me tell you something we know from another big study, um, and again, my clinical experience, is that there's a whole lot of dogs who have separation problems, but they're not real obvious. Um, you look at surveillance video and they're agitated and nervous and pacing while their person is gone. That's not the kind of welfare you want for the pet. That's not good well-being. These are people who knew quite obviously that their dog had separation anxiety, 19 out of 133. And dogs that have separation anxiety were significantly more likely to show nervous or panic behavior as their person pre uh, prepared to leave home. And they were needy. We see that in most of those cases. They also found, and we knew this anyway, but this study found that having another dog in the home did not help the problem. Occasionally it does, probably less often than occasionally. Not never, but almost never, okay? Separation anxiety is a disorder whose course may be difficult to alter in recently adopted shelter dogs using only basic interventional information. So brief counseling, a food dispensing toy, you know, this kind of a thing. Let me find the food toy. Excuse me, Gaston. You know, like a food toy like the twist and treat. These are really valuable. We certainly use them in the treatment of separation anxiety, but there's so much more that needs to be done, and every case is different. So we custom fit our management and our, and our uh, behavior modification, and very often the anxiety is so severe that we, we need medications if we're going to get our arms around it. Safe, no side effect medications. But again, I've got another little uh, method here that's really quite good. So just brief counseling and a food toy, not enough to deal with it. And the reason I'm bringing this stuff up is that if you give a surprise pet to somebody, um, if you make that mistake and they develop significant behavior issues, you know, aggression, separation anxiety, house soiling, I mean, the list goes on, um, it needs to be something that the person who's primarily, you know, the leader or the owner, if you want to use that term, um, needs to be ready for this stuff. So. Be a partner if you decide to uh, give a pet as a gift. So um, then you can sort of share the whole thing. So let me explain this thing to you. This is called the Calmer Canine. Let me turn the box around um, just so that you can see this. There we go. This is made by a company called Assisi Animal Health. And it's the Calmer Canine. Okay. So let me explain what this looks like. This is a... Oops, I need to turn the camera around, don't I? I'm going to show you this thing. There we go. It's this halo-shaped device, very lightweight, and it's got a battery, and you get this little um, fabric 
collar and old thing to go around the dog's chest and it velcros together. There's a little velcro pass. Miss America, honey, would you sit up so people can see? There we go. And so the the little um, velcro, uh, the little fabric collar that goes around their neck has a patch of velcro, and you just stick the device on like this. And two treatments a day, 15 minutes each, it turns itself off. It's very comfortable. Dog doesn't even notice. It has no sensation. And you know your dog can sit with you. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be perfectly still at all. Uh, but it, and it takes four to six weeks. But it is totally safe. And the, uh, the proof of concept study showed that 80% of the dogs had significant improvement. Now this is FDA approved for separation anxiety, but um, uh, we have found it to be effective against all manner of different kinds of anxieties in dogs. And what my recommendation is that if you choose to adopt a pet from a shelter, and God bless you if you do, uh, for all the right reasons. Um, but you should assume that there's some anxiety when you take that pet into your home because it's a change of environment. And it had another home prior to being in the shelter, even if that was on the street. And there's anxiety. Dogs get very bonded. They're highly social. And if we're going to give them a break, give them an opportunity to adapt, we can control their anxiety. And you don't need a veterinarian's prescription. You can go to the CZ website, um, actually, they've got a website for it. It's called calmercanine.com, C-A-L-M-E-R, the letter K, the number nine, dot com. And they've got them on sale right now. Um, of course, they tell me these things. Um, anyway, I'm not, trying to, <laughs> I'm not trying to sell you this. I'm just explaining that if you, if you get a pet from a shelter and you want to smooth the transition and reduce the risk of a dog developing anxiety-related problems, set them up for success with the calmer canine. And this is the only thing I know of in medicine that's actually guaranteed. If you use this for four to six weeks and feel like it didn't help, you can send it back and they'll refund your money. Um, you can't find a deal like that any other place. So, you know, I, I think, needless to say, I feel strongly about pets. And I want people to have that in their life. But I want everybody to have as good a shot at getting it right as they can. So have everybody in on the secret, okay? <laughs> And, and set them up for success um, and pick the right pet. So how do you do that? Well, there's always a gamble. And many shelters nowadays have temperament tests um, and other, uh, the, these things have been researched and we've come to learn that despite um, the best of intentions, no one of these different kinds of temperament tests that they administer in shelters is really uh, very reliable at all. Um, and w these things look like they were pointless until we had another study that showed that when you combine several tests, you can draw some inferences from it. The biggest challenge with these things is that these pets are tested in a shelter environment. And nowadays, shelters are far superior to what they once were, but there is always an element of stress because it isn't a home. You've got all these other pets and all that racket, and you don't have the warm and fuzzies that pets get in a home. That's what makes fostering so valuable. So they administer these tests in the, tests in the shelter and the test is, is administered by somebody who is not going to live with that pet when it goes to its new home. So what we do instead is I suggest that you, if you're going to consider you know, a handful of different pets, that you temperament test them yourself. Find one that responds to your personality because you're going to be the one living with that choice, right? Well, I have written an, a very good article uh, based on, on the behavioral science behind these things, and I'm going to put a link to that on my Facebook page when we're done with this tonight. And I'm also going to put a YouTube link for my videos on choosing a puppy and my video on choosing a kitten. Now, these are not necessarily for choosing an adult pet, um, but you can apply the same principles. So I want you to read those things and go through and watch those videos. They're not too long, they're not too boring. <laughs> and I want you to get a sense of what you're getting into and try to make as good a choice as you can. Um, and let's see if we can make everybody's Christmas and 2021 happy, including the pet, okay? So whatever your situation with your pets, I'm just encouraging everybody to take the time to build a, a relationship based on trust and freedom and choice for your pets. Because, just like people, 
They will get obstinate if the leader only tries to get their needs met and there's nothing in it for the pet. They, we want them to know that they can, at any point in their lives, they can trust us not to intimidate them, which people generally don't do by intention. They do it by accident because they don't know any better. Dogs and cats need choices and they need freedoms. And we can provide those because well, we're empathic, aren't we? We love pets. So um, just forget the surprises when it comes to pets, okay? And if you have any questions, please post them on my Facebook page. I'm always happy to field those. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just very grateful for you joining me for these things. I do them. I, I do these Facebook Lives, and I write a weekly media blog just to help bring out the best in pets and their people. And you can subscribe, by the way, at no charge. You can get these things in your email box every Tuesday morning. All you have to do is go to my website, drjeffnickel.com, D-R-J-E-F-N-I-C-H-O-L.com. Go to the bottom of the homepage, and you can subscribe. And, of course, there's no charge. And when you do, I'll send you my free at-home pet first aid and CPR guide. And then you can print those out and have those handy. Um, next week, on Monday, at 10 o'clock Mountain Time, noon Eastern, I'll be giving a webinar on holiday stresses for pets, how to avoid the problems, which sometimes results in anxiety and fear-related aggressive problems. And, um, and you can ask questions, and, uh, and you're welcome to join that. And if you want to register for it, go to Assisi, A-S-S-I-S-I, -S -S -I, like St. Francis of Assisi, Assisi animalhealth.com. Thank you for those hearts. And you can, uh, you can register for the webinar. And um, I hope to see you there. Um, so thank you again for joining me. I'm delighted to have my pets, and I hope your pets work out well for you and that you work out well for them. So have a wonderful, safe holiday, and please remember to wear your mask. <laughs>